Grand Theft Auto V. One of the largest video games of all time, Grand Theft Auto V was always bound to become a giant. It started off incredibly strong, with one of the largest, most alive video game worlds, with an explosively fun story mode, and a fantastic yet flawed multiplayer. Over the past eight years, focusing on online content, over promised single player DLC, and releasing on multiple console generations. This game showcased the best and worst parts of Rockstar Games, alongside the massive influence from Take-Two Games. And this video is dedicated towards showcasing all aspects of Grand Theft Auto V, going over its massive transformation over the past eight years. And then, at the end, I'm going to go over the future of not only Grand Theft Auto V, but the series as a whole. So welcome to the rise and demise of Rockstar Games. Rockstar's worlds have always been best in the industry. The ability to so accurately create a caricature of the setting in which they are based off of is one of Rockstar's standout talents. Whether it's the turn of the 19th century Midwestern United States in Red Dead Redemption 2, New York City in Grand Theft Auto 4, and of course, Los Angeles in GTA 5. The state of San Andreas is so true to life and the best example of a living open world that has ever been featured in a video game to date. Los Santos feels real and this is done so well by Rockstar that you don't even notice it until you pay really, really close attention. Rockstar has managed to engineer in imperfections in the map like uneven pavement and worn away road markings and unique textures for almost every single mile of this beautiful world. There are no clones in terms of buildings and neighborhoods. Every single house and neighborhood feels different. Every single street in Grand Theft Auto V has its own name, but it's not just a name. They all have a different feel to them. Take Cypress Flats, for example. Cypress Flats is the industrial district in the eastern part of the city full of factories and warehouses and larger properties as well, such as the Grand Bank's steel facility. Or you even have the abandoned train yard scattered with old used tires and cement blocks. A more suburban setting that showcases this perfectly is the Davis and Rancho area, just north of Los Santos International Airport. From the packed cul-de-sac of Grove Street that is filled with signs of graffiti and gang warfare, on all the way up to Carson Avenue just a couple blocks down, which is the main strip shopping center of the Davis area. And then of course, you have downtown LS with the Pillbox Hill area especially, home to the tallest skyscrapers in all of Los Santos, like the Maze Bank Tower and the Arcadius Tower. And on a much more grand scale, the variety in terrain, landscapes, altitude is absolutely staggering. You of course have the main city, complete with suburbs, outskirts, gas stations, multiple branching highways that lead all throughout the state of San Andreas. The center of the map is full of mostly hills, complete with some of the most epic roads fit for driving your favorite supercars. Heading slightly further up the highway will lead you towards Sandy Shores and the Alamo Sea. Sandy Shores, as the name would suggest, is full of sand, but it's not just that. The atmosphere of Sandy Shores is very different to anywhere else in the map. While Los Santos is packed with urban paradise for the upper class, Sandy Shores is much more rundown, full of dilapidated buildings, abandoned motels, and an actual prison on the outskirts of the town. And it's not just the buildings as well. Pedestrians in Sandy Shores behave differently, drive different vehicles, and even speak in different mannerisms to NPCs on other parts of the map. The state of San Andreas is not just pretty to look at. It is so much more than just skin deep. With its entirely unique news, politics, internet full of hundreds of unique websites and advertisements of a parody of the real world. To add another layer onto this world, Rockstar has always been famous for some of the best Easter eggs in gaming history. Some of the most famous ones from Grand Theft Auto V being the frozen alien from the first mission of the game, the ghost of Mount Gordo, the mystery eight killer, 
UFOs upon 100% completion of the game, and perhaps the most famous of them all, the Mount Chiliad Mystery, which to my own knowledge, is still not 100% solved 8 years after this game's launch. These really aren't just half-baked attempts either, with some of the mysteries like the Mystery 8 Killer having you solve clues and find the bodies of this serial killer all across the map, or the Ghost of Mount Gordo having ties towards the in-game politicians and events that happened in the game's world. You combine all of these attributes into one, and it feels disgraceful to even call San Andreas just a map. It is a living, breathing world, and from what I've seen, the best example of one to date. The largest selling point for any Grand Theft Auto game has always been the story mode. Grand Theft Auto V is no exception to this. Back in 2013, this is what Rockstar had intended you to play, and the story in Grand Theft Auto V tried some things that were very new compared to previous games. Starting with the focus on heists, Grand Theft Auto V has a plethora of heists to take part in, and all of them are fully customizable in regards to what approach do you want to take, what personnel you want to have. This was a massive addition to the game and really helped freshen up the single player experience. Some previous entries in the Grand Theft Auto series didn't even feature heists, and this is a massive improvement for Grand Theft Auto V. Now one massive departure from the series norm was the introduction of three main protagonists. This was a mixed bag, my own feelings being that I think three characters serves gameplay very, very well, especially in larger combat sections, giving you that opportunity for multiple angles of attack. My favorite example of this would be in the mission Blitz Play. There are so many different angles and approaches you can take if you want to use Trevor from above, Franklin on the ground, or Michael out in the back alley. This mission showcases this perfectly. On the other hand though, I feel in terms of building a strong narrative and developing a character arc, it would have benefited the game to have stuck with a single protagonist. I like to bring up Red Dead Redemption 2 as a perfect example of this. It is much easier to relate to one person's journey and development throughout a game than having to keep track of three separate character arcs, backstories, and then the main story. To give Rockstar credit, however, they did an absolutely phenomenal job with how they did it in Grand Theft Auto V. It may not be immediately recognizable in your first or even your second playthrough, but the game really is much deeper than you might expect. Before I dive too deep into the story of Grand Theft Auto V, let's take a quick look at the three main characters and go over their personalities and their backstories. Starting off with Franklin, Franklin Clinton is an LS kid growing up in the South LS. He got involved in the life of crime at a young age and joined the Grove Street families alongside his best friend Lamar. Franklin hates this lifestyle at the start of the game. He's working as a repo man and doing smaller scale crimes within the family's gang. He's not a fan of this. He hates it. He hates his friends and he really wants to find a way out. Michael DeSanta is a retired career criminal who faked his death to get out of the life of crime Michael is miserable. He hates his family even though he seems to want to bring up his relationship with them. And throughout the game, under unfortunate circumstances, he gets pulled back into his old life of crime. Trevor is a true sociopath. He's reckless, dangerous, has zero filter, and that's the best part of him. You always know Trevor is telling the truth no matter how bad it is. Trevor has been through a lot. A life of crime, abuse, all leading up to became who he is today. All three of our characters go through a story that is full of manipulation, greed, and finding out what truly matters. Before I get too into the story here, I need to preface I'm going to be getting into some heavy spoilers, so if you have not played the game, I'm going to leave a timestamp right here to skip to the next section of the video. But if you're wondering whether or not this story mode is actually for you and if you want to play it, I highly Highly recommend playing it, it is so much fun, and it has a lot of deep undertones to it that you might miss upon first completion. Grand Theft Auto V's story starts off in the past, with Michael and Trevor taking part in a bank robbery in North Yankton. This mission is essential 
to setting up GTA 5's plot, with the end of the mission stating that Michael's death has been faked and he was setting up an agreement with Dave Norton, a character that I'm going to be mentioning later on in the story. It's after this mission where you head to Los Santos and meet Franklin and Lamar for the first time. The first few missions as Franklin introduce you to Lamar, Simeon, Stretch, all vital characters throughout the game. It's first during the mission complications where Franklin goes to repo Jimmy DeSanto's car. Jimmy is Michael's son. And this is where Franklin first meets Michael. While taking the car back to the dealership, Michael pulls a gun on him and threatens him. Both of them don't get on initially for obvious reasons. But Michael in the end offers Franklin a drink and a talk at his place. This starts with where Michael starts this essential key point in GTA 5's story of luring Franklin in to this life of a big future, money, happiness, and getting out of his current situation. Franklin, of course, gets suckered into this, since all he's ever wanted to do was escape his current lifestyle. This all leads up to the first big heist of the game, the jewel store job. Michael and Franklin are laying low for a little bit after this jewel store job, and this is where we get introduced to Trevor for the first time. Your first few missions as Trevor aren't necessarily that monumental to the story. It's a lot of running, quote unquote, errands as Trevor, often involving many, many explosions. Soon after, Trevor gets a call from Wade saying that he has found a Michael DeSanta in Vinewood. Trevor finds Michael and we go about our first mission with the pair. Michael uses a lot of his same methods that he used with Franklin, talking about how good it is to have him back and he's trying to ease Trevor into coming along with him and how he's met this young apprentice in Franklin. Michael meets up with Dave Norton. Dave Norton is the FIB agent that supposedly killed Michael back in North Yankton and has all of this fame around being the officer that caught the famous Michael Townley. Dave needs Michael's help, and he starts this large chain of events that end up leading with Michael and the crew doing a bunch of work, including capturing an FIB target, all the way to robbing an armored car. Now this armored car contains bonds that a specific billionaire, Devin Weston, is particularly interested in. Devin Weston is a vital character in Grand Theft Auto V's story. Michael gets suckered into doing all sorts of work for Devin, including stealing tons of high-end cars all across the map of San Andreas. Michael repeats the same thing that he did to Franklin. He got enticed by the rich guy with the big house and this big reputation promising this huge future and money and fame and whatever he wants in life. Franklin himself acknowledges this in the upcoming mission, as this is the point where Franklin starts to realize that he's being used as a pawn in Michael's world. Devin Weston, in this stereotypical video game antagonist fashion, decides not to pay the gang for all of the work that they did for them. Devin was never really liked by Trevor or Franklin, as they saw through everything that he was saying. While Michael, this whole time, really liked Devin, because he sees something in him, he reminds him of himself, for better or for worse. The story of Grand Theft Auto V ends depending on what lesson you believe Franklin should have learned throughout the game. Option A, this is by far my least favorite ending for the game. This ending proves that Franklin got suckered into Michael's surviving his winning mentality. He feels no better than he did at the start of the game. He's miserable, he hates everyone around him, just he has all this money. He has become what Michael was at the start of the game. Ending B, this ending is a tricky one. I don't like this one either. It just proves Franklin got suckered into the same thing, survival over everything. Throughout the mission, Michael keeps saying you, I treated you like family and I did everything for you, but he really didn't. This just reinforces Franklin's anger. And while yes, this ending lets Franklin get back at the person who lied to him throughout the game, revenge is a fool's game. And this leaves him the exact same way as he would have been if he got rid of Trevor. Death Wish is the most satisfying ending of them all. All three characters stay alive. The only thing with this mission is there isn't really a big meaning to it. The mission, our crew goes and he takes out the remaining foes throughout the game. Steve Haynes, one of the FIB contacts, Devin Weston, and Stretch, one of Franklin's enemies. The main purpose of this ending is just to lay low afterwards. But to me, 
This ending almost feels as if it had had some sort of a tie-in to a single-player DLC, but we all know how that went. But that's the story of Grand Theft Auto V. Now sure, it's nowhere near as impactful as, say, Red Dead Redemption 2, or heck, even GTA 4 and other previous games in the series. But it has its moments, and it's full of these underlying tones that are really quite deep and are important. I, in the end, really enjoyed this story. Now, as I've mentioned earlier, single-player DLC was planned for Grand Theft Auto V, and it was even confirmed at one point. But something happened that changed the Grand Theft Auto series and Rockstar games forever, and that would be Grand Theft Auto Online. On initial release, Grand Theft Auto Online was bug-ridden, servers were laughably unplayable, but it had so much potential for a truly amazing multiplayer game. But absolutely no one, including Rockstar themselves, had planned for GT Online to go for eight years standing. Now let's go over Grand Theft Auto Online's evolution and focus by looking at some of its main DLCs and what they brought to the game and how they slowly changed over time. 2013 was very simple in terms of DLCs, starting off with the Beach Bum update. Beach Bum was our first ever content update to Grand Theft Auto Online, introducing all new clothing, a couple new vehicles, a couple fun new weapons, and some new customization features. Throughout all of 2013, and most of even 2014, these were the types of DLCs that Rockstar put out. Small little additions to have players come on for a few days just to check out some of the new content. And it must be noted that if you look at the prices of vehicles and weapons throughout this DLC, you can see that they are priced at or below the average vehicles that were in the game at launch. 2014, one of the standout DLCs from 2014 was the last Team Standing update, which added a new game mode, but much more notably, some tools which started Grand Theft Auto Online's massive griefing problem, which is still more than prevalent to this day. The bulletproof helmet and the marksman rifle are these two items, and I'm going to be mentioning this a lot more heavily in the later parts of this video. But be aware that this update was what started so much of the militarization and griefing issues with GTA Online. 2015 had one of the absolute most important DLCs to Grand Theft Auto Online. This would be the original Heist DLC. This one was crazy hyped up ever since Grand Theft Auto Online's launch, and it introduced five well thought out and creative heists that the GTA Online community had been absolutely begging for since launch. It brought tons of new cars, clothing, and so much more. And as Rockstar said themselves, heist was such a big undertaking that they were never going to do another heist DLC in the game. <laughs> well, that aged poorly. Ill-Gotten Gains Part 1 and Part 2 was the start of something that got even worse over time with Grand Theft Auto Online. The excessive inflation of in-game items. This update is notorious for vehicles like the Luxor Deluxe and Swift Deluxe, priced at 10 and 5 million dollars respectively. It must be noted that to purchase both of those with strictly online currency alone, if you're going to pay for them with shark cards, this would be over 150 US dollars for two aircrafts. The rest of the vehicles here were relatively fairly priced, it's just those main ones were absolutely horrible. Low Riders, this one was absolutely amazing. An all new modification shop with never before seen customization options, including engine modifications, visual tuning, hydraulics, interior customization, among other truly incredible features and new missions. 2016 was really big. The first ever business update to GT Online, Finance and Felony, brought in and introduced the CEO offices and crate warehouses. This is where the grind mentality of Grand Theft Auto Online started. Locking missions to public sessions where all of your hard work can be ruined in sessions. Bikers update. The second business update from 2016 was the bikers update, introducing the option to choose from multiple businesses as well as introducing passive businesses into the game. Import and export. The third business update in a single year 
was import-export. Using the SecuroServe platform from Finance & Felony, this became one of the more lucrative ways to make money at the time. Most notably about this DLC and something it's very famous for were the new special vehicles. Some of them costing up to 4.3 million in-game dollars for some of these vehicles. 2017 is where most of the community will agree started the massive decline in Grand Theft Auto Online. Gun running is the absolute start of this. Gun running introduced so many things to the game that are still prevalent to this day. Things like artificial game lengthening by adding in research, which is randomized unless you pay in-game money to skip the random elements up. Introducing the incredibly overpowered AI in missions and the having to drive all the way across the map just for a simple prep mission. And it's really not just that. This started the militarization of Grand Theft Auto Online with countless new militarized vehicles, including the oh-so-hated Oppressor Mark I. And to add fuel to the fire, this was only the start. Smuggler's Run? Wait, what's that? Another business DLC? The fifth one so far? What a surprise. Smuggler's Run is by far one of the worst updates that I have seen added to Grand Theft Auto Online. Basically just a reskinned version of Finance and Felody, but replacing the CEO crates with just slight retextures of items. Adding nothing much really new to the game apart from ridiculously overpriced airplanes. And if my memory is correct, Smuggler's Run was the introduction of drip feed vehicles. The Doomsday Heist. Hey, remember when Rockstar said that there was only going to be one heist DLC? Yeah, me too. The Doomsday Heist brought in a three-act heist which was actually pretty fun. I didn't like it as much as the original heists, but it was a ton of fun. But good God, the AI I mentioned earlier with the overpoweredness really, really started to come into play here. Oh, and, and the orbital cannon, really Rockstar, more griefing tools, great idea. 2018 brought in a couple new DLCs starting off with most notably After Hours. The reason that this DLC was made is so hilarious to me. Rockstar had realized they had made way too many business DLCs, so they made one new business to control them all. Oh, oh, and also this one introduced the Oppressor Mark II. Arena War. This one was a really, really cool concept, but I don't know about this one. Sure, it was fun for a little while, you had some really cool progression in some of the little mini-games and the arena war itself, but this is a GTA game, this is not Twisted Metal here. 2019 was all about Casino, starting off with the Diamond Casino DLC. Five missions in Grand Theft Auto Online, an all new addition to the map, replacing the original casino. All actually pretty cool stuff, apart from the obvious literal gambling. But the Diamond Casino DLC was made even better with the Diamond Casino Heist. Yes, the third Heist DLC. This one was by far the most revolutionary since the original, allowing you to completely customize the heist from approach, entry and exit, getaway vehicles, and so much more even all the way down to how difficult you wanted the AI to be. One thing that was extremely obvious in 2019 was the inflation of vehicle prices, a topic that I'm going to get into a little later, but this is when it starts to get really, really obvious. 2020 brought us my favorite update in a long time to Grand Theft Auto Online, which is just because of how consumer friendly this one was, and that would be the Cayo Perico heist. Yes, a fourth heist DLC. This one I really, really enjoyed. It brought in an all new heist in an all new location, which was able to be done completely solo. And it pays around a million dollars for less than an hour's work. Talk about improving the absolute horrible gameplay that was in GTA Online and the grinding before. That leads us on to this year. Los Santos Tuners was listening to the car community. We got an absolute banger in terms of tons of new memorable cars, customization, driving features, some of the most fan requested features of all time like the ability to raise and lower your car from the interaction menu. But the prices in this DLC, man you better have a big wallet. One of the issues that became absolutely massive as Grand Theft Auto Online grew was the issue that the game had with inflation and inconsistencies in prices. Let's look at vehicles first at the start of the game. Looking at the website for budget vehicles, 
Southern San Andreas Super Autos. Let's say you want an off-road SUV to go have fun. Well, you could pick up a Rancher XL for around $9,000. Want a smaller, slightly sporty car to have some fun in, mess around, customize? It's again, probably around $9,000 with the Futo. Let's say you got that inner speed demon inside of you. You want a fast motorcycle? Well, 15 grand will do you the trick. These prices are good. They're enough that if you want to do a couple races, missions, you can have a couple new vehicles. You can buy yourself a garage, you can fill it with some lower end cars and just have some fun. Looking forward to 2021, an SUV that is similar to the Rancher XL costs $835,000. A Futo with more customization options and pop-up headlights is $1.6 million. And that fast motorcycle you wanted to go around in costs $412,000. Oh, and it's slower than the old one. And let me assure you, you won't be able to afford these vehicles just from doing a couple races. Let's go even more high end with legendary motorsport. Let's say you want a decent supercar to rip around Los Santos in. Well, you can get a Pegasi Vaca for $240,000. Sure, it's not one of the fastest cars in the game, but it'll give you that street cred and it's a ton of fun vehicle to drive around in. Want one of the fastest cars in the game at the time, the Entity XF. Well, you're gonna be paying around $800,000. In 2021, a mid-tier supercar like the Fioria is $2.7 million, while top-tier supercars like the Krieger are $2.8 million or above. No one would complain about issues like this if it wasn't for how unbelievably inconsistent this is. Let's look at these two compact cars, for example. The Weenie Issy Classic, which is, again, a DLC car, it comes in around $360,000, and it has tons of customization, is relatively competitive in its class, and it's a great vehicle. Now, moving on to this year, we have the BF Club at $1.3 million. Roughly the exact same amount of customization, similar performances, but a $1 million price gap. The entire catalog of vehicles is full of inconsistencies like this. My guess is that Rockstar got lazy, greedy, or both, and just started trying to one-up the last car that was released, as you didn't see this when it came to the vehicles at the start of the game. A lot of this is just due to the mentality on how money has been handled over the years. When GTA Online first released, it was all about having fun, and that is exactly what the purpose of the multiplayer was, having fun. And the economy of the game at the time suited this. If you wanted to do maybe two or three hours doing some missions, races with your friends, just having a blast, at the end of it, you'd probably be able to afford, you know, a supercar or you can have a, a house, you can fill it up with some cheaper cars, have an off-roader, a motorcycle, a bunch of all this stuff. But over time, that mentality really switched and it became this absolute grind fest where now if a DLC comes out and you want to buy every single vehicle in this DLC, it can cost you 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars. And if you want to get that 50 million dollars, I can assure you it's not going to be a couple hours worth of races and missions. One of the largest reasons, if not the reason, Grand Theft Auto Online is still alive and kicking today is due to the sale of shark cards. You see, Grand Theft Auto V is the most successful entertainment piece in history, and Rockstar tried something new when Grand Theft Auto Online first launched. This was microtransactions. As someone who has played Grand Theft Auto Online since day one, my opinions on shark cards have changed dramatically over time, and let me explain why. On launch day, I was never really a fan of them. I didn't like them, but I didn't absolutely despise them either. And this is 100% due to their value and importance in the game. Let's start by talking about value. In 2013, 100 US dollars would get you $8 million in game. With $8 million, you could get it some pretty damn good stuff. You could get the most expensive apartment in the game, you could buy yourself multiple supercars, you can get planes, boats, and the vast majority of everything you could have ever wanted in GTA Online. Shark cards were also never forced upon you either. There were no shark card ads in the loading screens, there was no constant bonus offers, none of this. They were never really promoted except for up in the store menu. They were simply just for the people who wanted to spend some money 
and get some stuff in game and didn't have all the time in the world to grind. This is why at the start of the game, I never really had an issue with them. Of course, I was upset that they were in the game, but I wasn't kicking and screaming to have them removed. This is especially prevalent when it comes to the lower tier shark cards, the ones that most people actually bought. I'm gonna use the $20 card for example here. 20 US dollars will get you 1.25 million. This is enough to again, get you a good, really good selection of smaller cars or one or two good hyper cars. But unlike everything else in Grand Theft Auto Online, shark cards never changed over time. They now exist as pathetic wrecks that are honestly embarrassing for Rockstar Games and an insult to their player base. Using the $8 million card, for example, in today's GTA Online, you can get maybe two to four vehicles from a DLC. Let's use a smaller update, for example, here with the Los Santos Summer Special. Not including Benny's vehicles or vehicle upgrades, just completely stock cars is over $15 million worth of in-game items. This is just under 200 US dollars for less than 10 vehicles. This means that Rockstar is valuing these vehicles at around 20 US dollars each if you average it out. Things get even worse when you look at the lower tier cards. Looking at that exact same 20 US dollar card and the exact same DLC, you can afford only two vehicles from this DLC, which means that every single other vehicle in this DLC costs over $1.25 million each. Meaning that Rockstar believes that this SUV with a standard recycled interior from 2014 is worth $20, which may I remind you, is a third of the price of the entire game. And let's use a more different and modern example with the most recent update, Los Santos Tuners. Every single car in this DLC is over $20 each, meaning that 17 vehicles in this game are over $20. That is $340 for 17 in-game vehicles. At this point in time, it's not just the value that Shark Arts at the issue, it's the promotion and importance in the game. Every single time you load up Grand Theft Auto V, you will get some sort of promotion or ad to say, hey, buy a Shark Card and we'll give you a 20% bonus. If you buy this one, we'll you know, give you a discount or you'll get a prime discount. And it's not just in the menus, it is in-game too. There are Shark branding all over missions and races. It is absolutely pathetic how Robstar promotes this absolute garbage. It is so insulting to their fan base and it really shows their true colors and how greedy that they have become. There was a point in time when when a Rockstar logo popped up before a trailer, the whole world would go silent. They used to make some of the most well-crafted, beautiful trailers in the gaming industry. Think about Red Dead Redemption 2's reveal, Grand Theft Auto 4's reveal, and even the original Grand Theft Auto 5 trailer. But what happened? You would think that at the first game of the reveal of an all-new PlayStation 5 console, to quite literally sell this console and this game to an all new generation and crowd of people that you would pour your heart and soul into a well-crafted, brilliant trailer to really try and sell an eight-year-old game. But Rockstar seems to have lost their magic. This has been twice within the past year. They have showed trailers that show absolutely nothing and are absolutely broken, lazy, half-assed, and thrown together disasters. Let's start with the first trailer. Again, this is the one that opened the PlayStation 5 reveal showcase. It showed absolutely nothing about the game. It not only used existing PlayStation 4 footage from Grand Theft Auto Online trailers and the initial reveal trailer, but PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 beta footage to sell an all new 2020 console. Are you kidding me? It was incredibly obvious from this point onwards that Rockstar did not care one bit for their player base when making this trailer or this game. And if we thought the first trailer was bad, good God did Rockstar fail us again. They had an entire year to come up 
with an all new trailer to finally gain the respect of and interest from everyone that they disappointed with the initial reveal trailer. But Rockstar, once again, effort was too much of an ask for them. They presented us with an even more broken, cut together, pathetic excuse of a trailer that may I remind you, they had an entire year to put together. And how on earth do they manage to embarrass themselves this hard? This trailer showcased nothing except buzzwords like improved graphics and enhanced gameplay without actually showing anything as to what that actually means. Speaking of graphics, What's new here? Nothing has been improved. It looks the exact same as the PC version that has been around six years. The main selling point of this silly trailer was seamless character switching, a feature that guess what? already exists and it's not something that they had to program into the game it's just a result of the games running on the ssds of the playstation 5 and xbox series consoles they are literally bragging about work that they didn't even have to do and this trailer itself it wasn't just lacking features it was broken lester is sitting in two chairs reflections in mirrors don't even work license plates are for some reason yellow again an entire year to make this trailer. Rockstar does not care about making good games and putting effort into anything anymore. The only thing that this company cares about these days is money, and it is a goddamn shame how far that they have embarrassed themselves. Rockstar North has made themselves the laughing stock of the gaming industry. Look at this like to dislike ratio on the recent trailer. It showcases everything that you need to know about how fed up the community is with Rockstar's bullshit. When it comes to the future of the Grand Theft Auto franchise and Rockstar Games as a whole, so many recent developments at Rockstar Games have left me more concerned than ever when it comes to the studio's future entries and projects. Let's start by talking about the team at Rockstar North. The first development that started to really ramp up concerns for me was the departure of Leslie Benzies. Leslie was the president of Rockstar Games at the time, and he had been at Rockstar North since the development of Grand Theft Auto 3. So at the time he left, it would have been almost two decades that he had been with the company. Leslie was a massive reason that those Grand Theft Auto games were so special, as while yes, he was the president of the company, he was also game designer for such a long time. And it's only after Take-Two had taken a larger stake and control of Rockstar North that it was rumored that Leslie just did not like the direction that Take-Two was taking the Grand Theft Auto series in, especially regarding what they were doing with GTA Online. There was also a few legal battles between Rockstar and Take-Two where the details are a little murky and haven't been completely, you know, open to the public. So I'm not going to discuss those here. But all of this led up to bad blood between the two. And Leslie Venzies ended up leaving Rockstar North in January of 2016. And if you thought it was just Lindsay, my god, it gets worse. One of the Hauser brothers, the duo that founded Rockstar Games back in 1998, Dan Hauser, has left Rockstar as of March of 2020. This is also incredibly concerning. I mean, yes, he was there since 1998, so it could have been retirement. But as I'll explain slightly later, with the next person who left, the timing is a little off to me. Hearing that Dan left Rockstar was really, really saddening to me. Leslie and Dan created some of my favorite video games of all time, and I will always remember that about them, and will be so, so grateful for their incredible creativity and passion for those games. Although the one that truly left me worried to this day was the announcement that Laszlo Jones will be stepping down and taking a permanent leave from his job at Rockstar Games. Laszlo had also been working with Rockstar all the way back during Grand Theft Auto 3's development. Laszlo was a massive part of so many people's lives during his work at Rockstar Games. He had a huge personality, even just on the radio stations as a host, but even when he took the role as himself in Grand Theft Auto 5, he still delivered an incredible performance, and it truly, really upset me when I heard the news that he was leaving Rockstar Games 
in April of 2020. Now, one thing that had me concerned about these two departures is the timing of them. Dan Hauser and Laszlo Jones left within a month of each other. Now, sure, you could probably just chalk this up to just a coincidence, but I don't think so, especially considering this was just a few months before Grand Theft Auto Expanded and Enhanced was revealed to the public. And considering how little of that game has actually changed and upgraded, it was probably just starting development around that time before they announced it. Now look, I could see Dan leaving just to retirement, but when it comes to Laszlo, he didn't have a chance to truly showcase his brilliant creativity, talent, and personality. So I personally think that Laszlo left just to the fact that he was left to the wayside and was never used all of his incredible talents for anything. He was just fed up with Rockstar's lack of creativity and laziness when it came to actually, you know, developing games. Now, of course, there was also some details that Laszlo had with his personal life and he, you know, he was going through some rough stuff at the time, which would have absolutely influenced his decision with Rockstar. But considering that he's been working on other projects since he left Rockstar, I have a feeling that it was just he got fed up with them. And I can kind of see this argument with Dan Hauser too. You know, while yeah, he's been at the company for over 20 years, he is still passionate. He and Sam created this studio and made some of the greatest video games of all time. I mean, there's no way that he lost his passion for these games. It had to have been an incredibly hard decision for him to leave. Now taking all of this into consideration, who are the main game leads at Rockstar now? I'm incredibly worried that Take-Two has hired people to replace them that will only do things that make them money instead of people that actually care about video games and the Grand Theft Auto series. One of the arguments that I've heard countless times is to not be worried because, you know, Red Dead Redemption 2 released after GTA 5 and that game is amazing and a masterpiece. But here is my concern with that. Red Dead Redemption 2 would have started development around 2011 which means that all of the core development and foundations would have been done and set in stone before all of the core members of Rockstar left. Now, while yes, Red Dead Redemption 2 was a masterpiece, in fact, it's my favorite video game of all time. But with greed in GTA Online, Rockstar corrupted that game too. Look at Red Dead Online. Luckily, Rockstar got their ass handed right back to them on a silver platter, which how much of a colossal disaster and failure that that abomination of a game was. So when it comes to this whole, yeah, Red Dead Redemption 2 was good, so the next things that Rockstar make are gonna be good. I really don't believe it, and let me explain why. GTA 5, expanded and enhanced, is and will be a disaster. And while I've heard the argument that, oh, you know, all of Rockstar's issues are because of Take 2, I call bullshit. Yes, a big part of it is, but if Rockstar North gave half a shit, they would have actually put effort into Extended and Enhanced and made it something that was worth money. Rockstar North has gone so far down in such a quick time period. They have become a lazy, copy and paste DLC releasing shell of their former selves. And it is really going to take a lot to convince me otherwise of this, considering how far they have fallen within the past eight years. I am incredibly worried for the next Grand Theft Auto game whether it be called GTA 6 or another different title, the fact that there are none of the old game leads will keep my expectations incredibly low. I want a good Grand Theft Auto game. Of course I do. This is my favorite video game franchise of all time. But I am worried that what we will be getting won't even be considered a Grand Theft Auto game at all. Will it have a campaign that lasts longer than four hours? Will it be online only? Microtransactions, we already know, they're going to be in the game no matter what, obviously. But will they be in single player this time? Whatever it is, I'm keeping my expectations absolutely on the floor. Because Rockstar has given me absolutely zero reason to believe otherwise. Considering what they have, oh, I'm sorry, I mean haven't released as of late. Now one thing really, really quickly that I have to mention is during the writing of this script, the Grand Theft Auto Trilogy Definitive Editions have been announced and a lot of people are saying, yes, you know, Rockstar's listening, Rockstar, they're doing good things. But I need you to remember, this is not Rockstar North here. Rockstar Dundee is developing these. This is not North. This is not the main studio. So yes, it is incredible that these games are being remastered and I'm really, really excited to see how some of my favorite games turn out. It's just, 
that has absolutely nothing to do with the future of Grand Theft Auto 5, Grand Theft Auto Online, Grand Theft Auto 6, whatever it is. It has nothing to do with it. Dear Grand Theft Auto community, it is time to move on. It was a ton of fun. I have played this game since day one, and I have an absolutely ridiculous amount of time that I've spent with this game, probably well over 4,000 hours. The memories I've made with this game, the friends I've made, it has just been an absolute blast. But it is time to move on. And you may ask why? Well, it's time to stand up to Rockstar Games. Their treatment of this community has been nothing but absolutely disgusting. Starting with the most basic of things, online security. How on earth are they managing to be this outdated when it comes to security and making sure that their community is safe? This is really, really prevalent on PC. Anyone can access all of your personal information just by knowing your social club and rockstar id hackers can get your ip address and even basically find out where you live just from your rockstar id the most basic security feature of any online game rockstar games has not even bothered to look into in the slightest they do not care about your security and safety at all the only thing that they care about is your wallet. And may I remind you of that massive ban wave we had last year, when they banned a ton of people for cheating, including thousands upon thousands of innocent players who got all of their money legitimately and didn't even go, oh, whoopsies, we made a mistake. They just moved on like nothing happened. Rockstar's parent company, Take Two, has sent out lawsuits against modders of older games. Let me repeat that. They have lawsuits against mod creators for two decade old video games. They have even sent private investigators to some of the most prevalent people in the GTA 5 modding community. Are you kidding me? Take 2 tried to end OpenIV, which if you don't know is the main tool that was used to install mods on GTA 5. This was a huge deal a few years ago. Out of nowhere, Take 2 just decided you know what, we want people to play online and buy the content, so we're going to stop you from modding the single player and accessing content. And it absolutely backfired on them, they lost a ridiculous amount of PR and respect from everyone. Speaking of GT Online and money, there was no, hey, you know, we have realized that over the past 8 years, we've made the game even buggier, unbalanced, and broken than it was on launch. They can't even make up the security that's not even up to date for 2010. They can't listen to the community. They can't let us mod the games. This is one of the most played games on the planet, even eight years later. And it is a absolute colossal disaster. And I haven't even mentioned the hacking and cheating issues that are on PC and even on console now. I mean, come on, if hackers are getting into the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One versions of your game, you have a serious issue. Now, for how we fix this as a community, for the love of all that is holy, do not buy Expanded and Enhanced. Make sure that this is a colossal failure that Rockstar will never forget. It has to do worse than Red Dead Online. And I don't believe that you can do this because this community has been nothing but just buying it everything that Rockstar sells out. So if you're tired of this game and you buy Expanded and Enhanced, you have no one to blame but yourself. Vote with your wallet before it is too late. I mean, seriously, what is there to buy in Expanded and Enhanced? It is unbelievably unfinished and lacking in content. And you know, if this game does well, GTA 5 is going to release again on the PlayStation 6 and the Xbox Series 42069. And I thought this was obvious, but stop buying shark cards. Do not spend a single dollar on this game. It is so simple, and we have seen it done before. Vote with your wallet before it is too late. Before I start, let me be clear with who this is directed towards. This is not in any way directed at the developers and hardworking staff at Rockstar Games. You are all truly incredible. 
and are doing an absolutely mega job with what you have been handed and instructed with. Now, to all of the game directors at Rockstar, and whoever it is calling the shots at Take Two, what on earth have you done? Do you even realize how unbelievably dense, greedy, and lazy that you have become? You used to make the best video games in the industry, breaking records, setting the gold standard for open world games, narratives, and graphical fidelity, among so, so much more. But look at you now. How pathetic you have become. To call Rockstar North a shell of their former selves would be a compliment at this point. It has been eight years, and you have managed to destroy your entire brand reputation without even releasing a new game. Is this a new record? Has this ever been done before? Or have you seriously lost your minds this far that you are breaking new grounds in the gaming industry? From breaking the entire world in 2013 with one of the largest and greatest video games of the past decade to 2021, releasing an even more broken and unfinished version of a 2013 game. How? How? Do you realize that you have quite literally become the very thing that you used to make fun of? Oh, of course you don't. Your minds have been corrupted by greed. Now how can you fix this? I don't know. How am I supposed to say when you don't even believe in yourself? I mean, how on earth could you release Grand Theft Auto 6 and have it be good when you can't even manage to re-release -re Grand Theft Auto 5 without making a fool of yourself? As the wise Dark Viper AU once said, I'd ask you to do better but I really don't think you can.